and didn't pour it all over you like I did. Thank goodness I have black trousers. So I would now like to introduce our next speaker, the living legend, Professor Stig Bengmark. After a long successful career as a surgeon, professor and clinic director, Professor Bengmark has become an acknowledged world authority on chronic inflammation and chronic diseases, which he says the facts show are a result of dysbiosis. Professor Bengmark received his MD and PhD in medicine from Lund University in Sweden and has held the position of honorary visiting professor at University College London since 1999. He has been described as one of the three greatest European surgeons in recent history. Very pleased to welcome you, Professor Stig Bengmark. My mother should have heard that. <laughs> it's a great pleasure to be with you. My method to teach is to provide quite a huge, extensive material, and you have got that. Uh, and only to comment what is necessary. So it's meant for you to study back home. And the original PowerPoints are placed on my home page, and there you can find them and steal them and uh, recommend them to your friends and colleagues, etc. Use them in your teaching, whatever you want. You know, that's my mission to get you to teach health. My interest is the immune system. I was a surgeon. I was successful with some patients, but not with some. To begin with, I thought it was my, my fault. And then I realized that it probably was theirs. They were <laughs> obese. They had diabetes. And they had a poor lifestyle. So I started to study the conditions of health. And I became very interested in the gut. And I have been one of the pioneers. I studied, you know, the... the uh, um, microflora for the last 30 years, and even come out with some suggestions. I believe that it's our hands to choose whether we want to stay healthy or get sick. And that is the only thing I will talk about during my two hours. You will be bored to hear it. On the paper, we had made an enormous progress. The, a lot of diseases have been eliminated. You know, the infectious diseases, parasitic diseases, etc. But instead, we are hit by a tsunami of chronic diseases. This is a temporary victory because the year 2050 will resistant bacteria be the number one killer, more frequent than cancer. Although cancer is supposed to grow in incidence three times up to 2050, if we don't do anything radical. So we have increased the life expectancy from 47 years to 78. And many of the diseases, as I said, are under control. But instead, we have been hit by, as I say, a tsunami of very severe diseases. About 80% of all adults over 65 have at least one chronic disease. And the fact is, if you are hit by one, you are at risk of getting a second or a third, etc. That's how it works when you have a poor immune system and are open to diseases. What has happened during these years? We have changed our eating habits, I might say dramatically, increased the intake of animal fat, reduce the intake 
of vegetable fat. We eat much more omega-6 than omega-3. And then on top of that, many of the important antioxidants and vitamins and nutrients are no longer consumed. What has happened during this period? First of all, the girls start to menstruate seven years earlier than they did in the, in the 17th century. We feed much larger babies. Only in the, uh, we give birth to much larger babies. Only in, in the last 100 years have we changed what is the birth rate four times upwards. And this, of course, leads to uh, risky uh, uh, procedures when you give birth, you know, many more ruptures of the perineum and, and et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and this is uh, something which is very typical for our present time. Every animal who does not get the, the food they are intended to have get fat. Processed food is bad for all animals, including humans. You know. And they get healthy again when they are returned to eat um, the type of food they are supposed to eat. I retired as a professor of surgery at Lund University in 1994. And I decided to see what the different diseases have in common. And I found that they were almost like sisters and brothers, or at least cousins. It's exactly the same mechanism behind every almost human disease. And I wrote a, a, a review for a, a, a clinical nutrition a journal, and I called acute and chronic face reaction a mother of disease. If I had written it today, I would have called it inflammation, a mother of, of disease. And really, what matters is the degree of inflammation in your body. And reading the degree of inflammation gives you really forecast to what will happen to you with time. In the footprints of this concept comes that we have started to recognize foods which are uh, reducing inflammation. And the list is long. This is only uh, an ex some examples. And foods which produce inflammation. It's easy to measure today. It's easy. And I believe that's what your profession is about. Recent studies, this was published uh, uh, two years ago, shows that you need quite a lot of plant food, for example, to reduce bladder cancer. And as you will see on the next slide, you have to eat one to one and a half kilogram of fresh raw food every day. Don't shoot the messenger. <laughs> no. This is what it is. And if you eat 800 grams, which was published in February this year, of fruit and vegetables, 10 portions is associated with 28% reduction of cardiovascular disease. 24% reduced risk of heart disease, 33% reduced risk of stroke, etc. Don't forget it. Fresh, raw fruits and vegetables. Processed food is the killer. And these 
contains a lot of the substances which are destroyed in processing of the food. Most important, the microbe, my, microbial biomass, you know, the flora of the intestine, which is there to prime your immune system and make it work optimally. And many studies now are performed to try to identify foods with the optimal effects. You can study this back home. And that's, all these have led to the conclusion that every man and woman is the architect of her and his own health. And you are going to be the missionaries to tell people this and help them. I mean, it's wonderful with supplements, but don't do what doctors have done too long. Prescribe things. Teach them what they should eat, you know. You, can, you will come a long way. I have a problem with Swedish nutritionists because they want to mimic the doctors who have prescription notes and write down things. It's more important that you spend your time to teach people what's good for them and what's bad for them. I'm impressed by this young teacher from Southampton. She decided to change lifestyle at an age of 25. She lost 95 kilo and avoided gastric bypass and all the other crippling operations and instead got back her beauty and her respect in the society. Which of these contains much sugar? I'm sure all think it's sugar. No, it's bread. The, the glycemic index is about 90. In some studies, you know, depending on the, what they use, it's only 68. The baguette is 95. And, and the record is 135 French baguettes. French baguettes. One is worse, parsnips, British parsnips, 137. <laughs> These foods are the most fattening They should be avoided. Well, I have some wine some, sometimes, but it's about <laughs> it, you know. If the Americans who abuse food, they get high weights. I, so not this man, but a similar. They have to drive him to uh, a slaughter to weigh him because hospitals had no uh, scales which could measure almost 635 kilo. He had abused his life at an age of, uh, I believe it was 42, uh, and he is no longer with us. So negative to human health is more than anything bread and dairy products. And I'm going to explain that to you. Here is a brief summary that will come much more information as we continue. Another thing which is a problem is that food has been uh, what they call breeded which always means that it has been destroyed. So here is an example, for example, about apples, you know. See how they lose of different contents up to 96% of iron, etc., etc. So it's also a problem that we need to go back and find plants as they used to be. However, it's more a psychological problem because we cannot eat them because they are not sweet enough, you know. So we won't do that. Because all the plant breeding has been gearing towards making them sweeter to contain more and more sugar. 
And this has led to exposure to far too much fructose. So we need uh, to, uh, uh, what to say, keep them under control, you know, and, 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 not, and eat only occasionally on this side, between boysenberries and figs, about three a day, but while we can eat freely between limes and grapefruit. And fructose is increasingly involved with many diseases, especially dementia. So a food which is deficient in omega-3 and rich in fructose has a much higher rate of dementia. While a food rich in omega-3 uh, is uh, very much uh, controlling the inflammation leading to dementia. And, and the same is shown in other studies where they showed that the old type Mediterranean diet, it does not exist anymore. They, people in Italy etc., seem to eat about the same as all of us, uh, have an enormous control on, the, uh, on memory. This is what you must teach your patients. The diabetes is increasing two, two to three times till 2050 if we don't do anything. And it's no longer a British problem or an American problem or a Scandinavian problem. It's a problem in Arab countries, in India, uh, etc. They are soon having a high rate of obesity, diabetes, uh, uh, Alzheimer, etc. And the curve looks about the same for Alzheimer, you see. It's no health system can, can cope with this. Don't think that NHS exists 2050, no matter how much money they shovel into the system it will not be enough to control this epidemic. The, presently, the highest rate, the epicenter of a tsunami is in southern USA. It's spreading with agriculture, where there is modern agriculture there is also a high rate of chronic diseases. But soon, as I said, the Arab world will take over. Well, US and Britain will also be affected. It's calculated that, that by the year 2030, there will be 76 million more obese in these two countries. 5% of the global population. Six to seven million cases of cardiovascular disease. Uh, more than half a million more cancer, etc. And the cost for this is going to be enormous. They have looked at what's called meta-analysis. That's summarizing all the studies ever done of uh, the risk of cancer when obese. You can read it back home. It's so, a study done in the year, I remember it, 2002, prospects that by the year 2020, only three years left, will the costs for healthcare in the US be half the income of a family after tax. 50% will go to healthcare 
and will not give perfect care to the Americans. So this is the, the, why they are so ambitious to try to eliminate Obamacare because they are, will not be able to pay for it, they claim. So instead, of course, we must turn on other ways. We must do something about obesity. And there are studies showing that if we spend more on preventive measures, only a few dollars, we could save enormous amounts in healthcare costs. When I was a child, the most deadly factors behind, behind health was smoking and alcohol. Now we have put a whole a group of lifestyle diseases in between the two. Together, these are uh, more deadly than alcohol and smoking together. And we have identified the four important killers. That is excessive body weight, hypertension, impaired sugar balance, and dyslipidemia, too much fat in the blood. These are forming a group which we call the quartet of death. And I've written a chapter of, uh, uh, about that which is available on my home page. We have known something called metabolic syndrome for almost 100 years. The name was coined for about 50 years. But the group of symptoms which leads to disease were identified much earlier. And it all focuses Cling the fat belly, the mother of disease, uh, and it's surrounded by a lot of diseases which you all recognize from your praxis. You know that. As I said, the, these diseases are not only European and American diseases. They are the mo most frequent, uh, the, the place where they have most frequently uh, stroke is, as you see, Tanzania, urban Tanzania, much different from uh, rural Trans Tanzania. It's uh, it is a result of having got supermarkets, cheap food, and access to uh, as much food as you want day and night. Now I will teach you a word which you must never forget. It's postprandial. It is after meal that your inflammation will flourish. Most of the deaths uh, are during the night after a big meal. Another fact which I want to point out is genes are important, but they follow your directions. It's not the genes per se who decides to make you sick. It's the way you treat them. If you activate you know, the genes, the result will be inflammation. 1,200 of your genes, your 25,000, are involved in the inflammation. Leave them sleeping, 
and you will stay healthy. So, it, as a matter of fact, it's clear that 90 to 95% of your disease are due to the environment. Not necessarily what you eat. Many, many, many other factors are important. And only 5 to 10% are inherited. Here they are. Mainly testicular, uh, thyroid, laryngeal uh, are these. And, and here are the, the different factors which influences our health. Let the yin sleep and you are healthy. It's as simple as that. How? Study this. So, there are three major factors which are important. The harmony of your soul, let me call it that. The harmony of your soul, the control of stress, your exercise, and the food you eat. And let me be humble. The least important is the food. The other two are even more without harmony, stress control, and exercise. You are going to be a loser. Studies with what's called calorie restriction, when you are only allowed to eat 75% of what you want to eat, or as a matter of fact, less, two-thirds, 66%. You can eventually eat what junk you want as long as you eat little amounts and the body will be able to cope with it. Isn't that fantastic? It's when you overburden <coughs> the body with uh, unhealthy food that you have problems. So, and the exercise must be with speed. It's not walking your dog or playing golf. It's about speedy exercise. Half an hour, five days a week is enough. I'm, I'm sure you can find this half an hour every week. Okay. And when it comes to food, it's three factors. It is what the food contains, it is the amount, and listen, it's also when you eat it. And I will finish about talking about, you know, what eating times are suitable, how many times you should eat, etc., etc. So, I am an ombudsman for microbiota. That's my mission in life. And I know that they dislike toxic substances, even pharmaceuticals, even supplements. They want to have it the natural way. So there's a whole list of toxic factors which we must stay away from. So the lesson is avoid processed food. And we are getting quite a few now who avoid processed food and eat fresh greens instead. And again, there are so much pesticides on them. Even what's called organic wine is full of pesticides. So they only choose different pesticides which are known to uh, kill fishes in our rivers, still in organic wine. And I borrowed this from Dr. Mercola. You see, there are a dozen dirty fo foods. These must be eaten organic. Grape is the worst of everything, you know. It's really uh, terrible. The others, they, to the right, as you see it, they are called the Clean 15. I think the, I have this in my uh, wallet uh, when I go shopping. I, I must present my wife, Marianne. Yeah, Marianne there. She is helping me with that. But we often do it together. Sure. So we are now 
in a vicious circle where the food we eat affects and destroys our microbiota, make us impotent immunologically, and uh, uh, make us affected by diseases. So, and it starts at McDonald's. It's the fatty, fizzy food which makes you sick. It creates obesity that we know. It gives li poor liver function, insulin resistance, diabetes, uh, polycystic ovary diseases, impaired ovulation, acne, etc., etc., and make your whole gut function badly. It creates a fire in your abdomen. And, and I'm coming back to that. 80 to 90 percent of your immune system is in your abdomen. It's not in the bone marrows and lymph nodes, as I was taught when I went to medical school in the 50s. I mean, 1950s. <laughs> so, a leaky gut, poorly functioning gut, which leaks toxins into your body, is the mother of diseases in all organs. All organs, no exception. Including what I'm often, I'm tired to hear about, chronic fatigue. Chronic fatigue or hypothyroidism, which is so frequent today. It all originates in the gut. And the killer is often endotoxin, a bacterial toxin which comes with your meal into your general circulation and stays there far too long. Endotoxin. Uh, all these diseases are associated with high endotoxin in your blood. This is one of the most promising papers I have read. To Finnish, be proud of the Finnish so, uh, scientists, they decided to recondition the gut of the mother and the baby by giving them probiotics during the last three months of the pregnancy and the first six months of the baby. And they observed 15 years ago that they could reduce allergy to less than half. But now comes the proof of how clever they were. 15 years later, they said to each other, shouldn't we see if these children have got ADHD or what's called uh, 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 they said Asperger disease. So they hired experts on Asperger disease and ADHD and studied them. And listen, probiotic treatment of the mother and the newborn children prevented totally ADHD during the coming years. No case were detected. Why? 17%, 6 of 35 have the disease. Isn't this promising? Indeed. So, the neonatal gut flora. I mean, it's so important how the mother lives when she is pregnant. And it's even more important that the, mother, that the breast milk is provided as long as possible because breast milk is the best food ever produced. They can, nobody can reproduce that artificially. It comes with lactobacilla, important uh, conditioners for the membranes, fibers, etc., etc. So, what is happening in front of our eyes is that we are moving away 
from drugs towards lifestyle. So the, the line between drug styles, health, li lifestyle and drugs are moving upwards and will probably be a minor factor in some years. Might take 100 years, but your profession will probably help people to take the responsibility, responsibility for their own lives. We have to target metabolic syndrome mode and need to do extensive lifestyle modifications. So, and the food pyramid will totally change. I have problems back home with dietitians. They love the old food pyramid <laughs> and the plate model, you know. They belong to history. They should be uh, put in the waste can. We are on the way to a different, a new food pyramid. And my hope is the nutritionists. But they have some problems, they too. They seem to sometimes remain something in between a dietitian and a doctor. They should move much higher up. So this is my food. And as a matter of fact, many of the people I know give it to their dogs as well. And they do well. Vegetarian dogs are increasing in Sweden. <laughs> so, and we start to look into what does this food contain? And here is a list. And this comes then to what I call eco, eco-biological, this is substances which have the same effect as the biological drugs, but no less powerful, but no side effects. So the Champions League of antioxidants is becoming increasingly interested. It's the top of the Champions League is clubs. How often do we eat clubs? Sumac and, listen, Ceylon cinnamon, not uh, that uh, other, I will here. So here is the Champions League. Eat them every day. And don't eat the cinnamon which supermarkets have. It's called Saigon cinnamon or fake cinnamon. It is toxic, should not be given to children under five years of age and should not be eaten in larger amounts. While Ceylon cinnamon contains almost 100 times as much antioxidants, for example. Select also your food from the perspective of, uh, of uh, uh, or let's say, select your food after you know the list of ORAC values, but don't forget that glycemic index is extremely important. Low glycemic index. I try to eat personally under 20, except up to 50 but abandon everything above, above 50. Aubergine then, which is the new avocado, and is eaten raw now. It is, has a glycemic index of 15. Hmm? The bacteria will love it. It's okay. And on basis of this, have I done uh, uh, produced a, a recipe for an anti-inflammatory drug or shot is a modern name 
which is built on the uh, Champions League leaders. And I can say oh, there are hundreds of thousands in Scandinavia who take this every day in combination then with uh, changing lifestyle. I call it, uh, I'll come back to that. And uh, so, so you are free to try it. It is in your papers. And we try to identify as many anti-inflammatory foods as we can. And I, here is a list, for example, if you are looking at the master antioxidant, glutathione, your chlorophyll, your omega-3, etc. The American Food and Drug Administration ordered researchers to look at the best food with regard to content of these different substances. And they came up with this list. See? Number one, 100% watercress. Chinese cabbage. How often do you eat Chinese cabbage? Uh, chard. It's uh, beet greens. You know, in 100 years, sugar beet, they will show, give away the, the beet to the cows and eat the greens instead because this is where the nutrients are. And here is the continuation of that list. You have them in your paper. So, they decided to make a study comparing people who ate raw food, raw food with um, those who run 80 kilometers a week, marathon runners, and those who were coach potatoes. Hmm? Look and see. The average systolic blood pressure was 104. The systolic blood pressure, 62. The fasting glucose, fasting insulin, homo IR, the inflammation, C-reactive protein, O52, when it was here, 262. It is very impressive and stimulating effects. And here are several from that study. You can study it. An insurance company in US were tired of having all receptionists weighing over 100 kilo. They thought they were uh, uh, really uh, bad publicity for the company. Before I really put them uh, inside somewhere, they did offer them uh, and, uh, a different treatment. So they were uh, uh, put on low-fat vegan food. And you see, you see on what progress they did. See? And they learned everything was fine, except that after that they had difficulties to find restaurants where they could eat. So, inflammation is due to low intake of fresh plants, high intake of heat, and storage-induced proteotoxins. And I, here, you can hear, you will hear soon what the, the name of them, and uh, higher intake of heat, and, yeah, higher intake of proteotoxins, casein, gluten, casein from corn, higher intake of heat damaged food. Okay, leave that. They have created a list of food you shouldn't eat because you get gut problems, it's called high food map. I am here to tell you, throw it in the bin, because you then exclude a lot of important food for the bacteria. What's called fructans, extremely healthy foods, you know. Asparagus, uh, for example, banana, 
etc. And so I, threw, I think here, I believe that. Uh, there are plenty of lists. There are 36,000 foods which contains fructans. You cannot eliminate them all. And as I said, they are favorite food. Try to get back the bacteria which are able to ferment fructans. Then you will have no longer IBS problems. So, it has become very interesting to study people who live like our Paleolithic forefathers. And especially the group of Hansa is very important. And the diet they eat is much an example for us. They almost all become 100 years of age and they rarely have diseases. They eat only twice a day despite starting working in the fields five o'clock in the morning. So my composition is 80% raw greens, 10% vegetable fat, cocos, coconuts, avocado, and 10% vegetable proteins, not dried before. Now you can buy them at Tesco or everywhere, fresh frozen, like we had, had had access to peas, green peas, for many years, and more are coming. I'm hoping for mung beans, for example, to soon be on the market. And I believe that we are on the way, it might take many years, to have the, uh, the, the uh, food nutrition based on greens instead of processed, processed food. Eating is dangerous, much depending on what you eat. You get a high, no, back here, a high uh, uh, peak of sugar, eventually three days, three times a day. Some eat even more. And that produces what's called postprandial inflammation. So we have to look for foods which reduces the postprandial inflammation. And these foods are called low glycemic index foods. You understand which why I try to eat under 20, and if possible up to 50, but avoid bread, spaghetti, uh, pizza, etc., etc. The postprandial inflammation is linked with postprandial hyperlipidemia. It is important to me to say that the short chain fatty acids, coconut, avocado, etc., they can be absorbed immediately via the portal vein and utilized. The long chain fatty acids, pig fat, cow's fat, game animals fat, even olive oil, have so long molecules that they must enter the body via the uh, lymphatic system. And they stay long time, two hours or so, in the general circulation. And these fats are massaged towards the intima of the blood vessels. Some is taken up. Some produce inflammation and ateroma, ptosis. So the food we eat are either easy access foods, that's sugar, but we can only store a limited amount, about 800 calories. 
Fat is also easy access. We can store as visual fat if we are obese, six kilo. All the others must be stored under the skin. So our forefathers, they ate foods which entered after having been fermented by bacteria five, six hours later after the meal. That was the, ma the majority. Some had entered the animal fats through what I call the back door, and some entered as sugars. Today it's almost the opposite. I have some people, though they are younger than me, who are really my idols. And one of this is a Norwegian scientist. He showed that the immune system is not as we thought in the bone marrow, lymph nodes, and spleen. It is in the gut. And the way we treat the gut primes our immune system, make it functioning optimally. Believe that. And that should be said. And we have that cells under the uh, mucosa, which hold dendritic cells, because they have a, an arm which they put into the intestine and sample from what's in, in the intestine. Then they move to the closest lymph node and stay there for five days, not killing what they have taken, which all other immune cells do, but they sort of listening to the signals and are priming the immune system after the signals they have from the intestine. And one such dendritic cell will command about 1,200 T cells, soldier cells, who go out in the body and, and, uh, and pr provide immunity. So the message is, individuals with higher levels of inflammatory markers are the candidates of chronic disease and complications to disease and treatments. And those who have any of these problems, they are suffering inflammation. They go to the GP and get a drug against obstipation or something else. That doesn't solve their problems. This inflammation, which is the underlying problem, which they should solve. I have plenty of friends who had sweaty feet and got a drug, went back and said, I can't sleep, got another drug, then the hair would have, uh, disappear and they got the drug against that, etc., etc. This is not the problem. These are warning signals. And if you have inflammation, you might start with one disease, but then the, another and another and another disease comes, a phenomenon called clustering. We know, know that certain families have certain diseases, several diseases, certain working, workers have certain diseases, etc., etc. Certain uh, uh, races have certain diseases. Clustering is an extremely important uh, phenomenon which we might learn about and control. So we must break this vicious circle between inflammation and infection. And it's not antibiotics, it's not even drugs. It's alteration of lifestyle which matters. So as a matter of fact, our bacteria hate drugs. It's not compatible. We have to choose other drugs 
or lifestyle. It's even so that they hate a sleeping tablet. If you take 18 pills a year, you are shown to increase your, uh, uh, your disease risk of death with 360%, and if you're more than 132, with 532%. So it's nothing to play with. Another interesting observation is that fatty people have different bacteria, totally different bacteria, and that they have also, as a result of different microbiota, do they also manifest themselves differently. Already within a week after eating a fatty meal, do you have signs of inflammation in your tissues, in your blood, in your uh, adipose tissue, and in your uh, mesenteric lymph nodes? It's eating too much animal fat starts the vicious circle. And that has led to attempts to try to find anti-obesity, anti-inflammation foods. Casein and gluten are pro-inflammatory. This is an old study. Without casein and gluten, bacteria would grow satisfactorily. With casein and gluten, they would disappear. And gluten has the same effects in the body as endotoxin. It uh, can be measured and compared to endotoxin. All these diseases are in persons who have not gluten intolerance, but are still sensitive to gluten because gluten induces inflammation. It's not a genetic disease, it's called gluten sensitivity. When tried in patients with type 8 diabetes, gluten-free diet uh, reduced, uh, increased the sensitivity to uh, insulin and reduced the di diabetes in 12 or 14 patients, and it was increased, it was, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the sensitivity was decreased again when returning to normal food. The same has been demonstrated in IBS, uh, etc. And the interesting thing is that um, it's also seen in ADHD as an inducer. So there's much you can do. And, and more interesting is if that you give the, uh, the patients the old gluten, the old wheat which was produced before it was uh, altered. I mean, the modern bread contains 20 times or more gluten than the old, old bread. Then these symptoms would not appear. I think we leave it here. So it's time now for a, an intermission. Okay, we meet again. What is what was the time? Yeah, sure. You decide, and I will be ready. Fifty minutes. Fifth. So let's uh, say then. 15 minutes to three, is it okay? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. oh, there you go. Oh, there you go. Oh, there you go. Sorry, 
seats in the countries where we haven't uh, uh, been manipulating them as we have done in the past. And you find some extraordinary new seats, quinoa, amaranth, sorghum, uh, millet, teff, etc., which probably is the food or bread for the next generation. And if you look at that, you will be amazed, you know. The ORAC value for broccoli is here. For sorghum, for example, it's up here. It's food with a, seeds with an ORAC value we didn't know exist. So, okay, have your intermission. <laughs> <laughs>